And this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, growing trade tensions between Japan and South Korea are threatening to upend the global tech supply chain. We will discuss which companies are being hit hardest by Japan's export restrictions. Plus, Apple downgraded. It is the fifth sell rating for the iPhone maker, the most since as far back as 1997. Our conversation with the analyst behind the hit. And Facebook's Night Watch, how the social media company is fighting fake news on Facebook about Facebook and, yes, paying tribute to Game of Thrones while they do just that. But first, to our top story. While the world fixates on trade tensions between China and the United States, another dispute between Beijing's neighbors is weighing heavily on chip makers. Last week, Japan slapped restrictions on exports to South Korea of crucial materials needed to produce semiconductors and cutting edge screens. Samsung, South Korea's largest company and the biggest maker of smartphones, slid nearly 3% Monday. SK Hynix dropped 1.5%. Together, the two account for 60% of the world's memory chip making capacity. And many investors and analysts are suggesting the implications may go far beyond chips, upsetting the global tech supply chain for everything from iPhones to laptops. Joining me here in the studio, Bloomberg's Ian King, who, of course, covers chips for us. So why is this happening now? Yeah, it's a very good question, Emily. I mean, it's something that goes back over 100 years, you could argue, with you know, Japan's invasion and colonization of Korea. Um, there's always been tensions between the two countries. Korea argues you never apologized, you never made amends properly. The Japanese side is, well, oh yes, we did. How many times do we need to apologize? And, and this appears to have bubbled up into the tensions that we're seeing right now. But could it have anything to do with President Trump and him taking a similar tact well, or strategic move in, in, in dealing with China? And that, that, is, that is the argument, that is that, you know, that the Japanese side, for domestic political reasons, are like, look, we've had enough of this, Korea leave us alone stop you know stop making these noises this is something that needs to be put to bed once and for all and if you don't here are the kind of measures we can take in, in a similar way to the sort of trade sanctions we're seeing being used against China Peter Elstrom with us now who runs our Bloomberg news operations out of Tokyo Peter you know talk to us about the bigger picture you know this is another uh, you know tension between two other powers that we simply haven't been focused on in the you know long-running dispute now between the US and China yeah, that's right. I think with the broader trade tensions between China and the U.S., they've sort of lost sight of these two very critical uh, countries. Uh, Japan and Korea are very closely integrated in a lot of ways, especially with chips and, and the, then the components that you need to be able to make chips and screens and that sort of thing that plays into this broader technology supply chain that's necessary really around the globe. But these rising tensions between the two countries have become quite acute. Uh, at this point. Uh, they date back uh, to World War II, but they festered over the years, and there's disagreements on both sides about who's to blame and exactly how much they're to blame. It's a bit surprising that it's coming up at this point, but it is kind of a critical point, and the Abe administration in Tokyo now has this opportunity to kind of gain some political points as they put uh, these export uh, restrictions in place on, on materials that are very important to the Korean economy. So, Ian, what are the materials being affected and how will they affect the manufacturing of these products at Samsung, at SK Hynix and elsewhere? Right. I mean, we're talking about chips and we're talking about screens and that's basically a, a chemical process, right? You layer on, on materials, you're scraping them off, you're making these patterns that become chips, that become uh, your, your LCD screens. And Japan is very good at the fundamentals of manufacturing and of developing th those chemicals which are absolutely essential to this process. Korea is much better and much stronger at the actual manufacturing of these end components. And as Peter said, the two go hand in hand. If Japan does cut off these key parts of the process, then Korea is going to have to look elsewhere and there's going to be a major interruption to the supply of some significant components. So you say major interruption. Peter, how serious could this get? Well, we've been talking with analysts to try to get a good estimate about how much supply key companies like Samsung and Hynix have at this point in case they do get cut off and what that's going to mean. So there are estimates that range a bit, but it may be about 30 days. If this goes on for a long period of time, 
it, it could hit the key components that Ian was just talking about, the semiconductors and the, and the displays that Korea is manufacturing that are important for all the companies that we talk about in the technology industry from Apple to Dell to HP. So it could have a very broad impact, but it depends very much on how long this lasts. So I have a chart here in my Bloomberg showing Samsung's profit plummeting. Of course, they reported earnings last week. They were not great, Ian. These companies are already suffering from larger geopolitical issues, larger macroeconomic issues. How will this impact, let's say, a Samsung in, in, you know, on top of everything else that's going on. Yeah, no, I mean, this is absolutely a worst case scenario for them. Right now, they're facing, you know, demand constraints. The world economy, China, the US, you name it. Th these are all key markets for them that aren't looking that great, given, the, you know, this geopolitical situation. And now, something which could actually hurt their ability to supply it. So in the short term, it might actually help everybody because the price goes up because it's a commodity. Long term, though, they really, really need to stay in production. Chip plants cost seven, eight billion dollars. They run 24 hours a day for a reason. They're useless within five years. You know, they're depreciated. Hmm. They're absolutely. They're just, you know, you're pouring money into a black hole if they're not producing flat out. So how is it that two South Korean companies have come to dominate this particular part of the, yeah. the chip market? And, and that's, that's a fascinating story. I mean, particularly Samsung is an amazing story. They were written off in the 80s as being a Me Too company. The Japanese were absolutely transcendent then in memory chips and yet along come the Koreans and takes that business off them by just being better at production. One of the arguments here is that oh, Toshiba, a company which has already lost out to Samsung in a lot of ways, invented a lot of the fundamentals of the technology, actually now maybe they, the, you know, they're in, back in the spotlight again. Maybe they can see a way forward against the Koreans. You know. Peter, could this be an opportunity for other companies, let's say Chinese companies or, or perhaps even a Huawei? Uh, well, I, I think Ian probably hit the most likely beneficiary on this front. Uh, Toshiba, because it's a Japanese uh, company, would be able to sidestep uh, some of these controls. Toshiba is a company that's had many problems, uh, many self-inflicted problems. They had to spin off their chip business because of kind of a disastrous foray into the nuclear business earlier. But that unit is still pretty strong and it may be able to gain some market share. Uh, in this particular uh, opportunity. And, and again, who else is a, a beneficiary or hurt by this will depend in large part on how long it lasts and exactly uh, how this plays out over the next few months. You got a couple of negative factors kind of layered on top of each other. There was a slowdown in the smartphone market even before this trade war really kicked off. The smartphone market had begun to shrink and it's shrinking again for the second year. Uh, and then you had the trade war layered on top of that. So you got a couple of different problems that are kind of hitting these companies uh, in a few different spots. Ian, what's the best bet for how this gets resolved? I mean, domestic politics in Korea, domestic politics in Japan, they're going to be, you know, how much pressure comes on to the, the administrations to give ground, whether they can make, a, you know, an equitable accommodation with each other out of it. That's that's going to be the, the way to watch for the signs. Best bet is they'll probably back down because Japan needs its high-tech industry as well. It needs to, its chemical manufacturers to be supplying huge customers like Samsung. Interesting. Uh, another little dramatic dispute to continue to follow. Ian King, Peter Elstrom, thank you. Thank you. All right. Speaking of Asia and another country, China, the venture capital boom there shows signs it's turning into a bust. The value of deals plunged 77 percent in the second quarter from a year ago. The venture boom began in 2014 when Alibaba went public in the largest ever IPO. Chinese venture deals tripled that year. Coming up, Rosenblatt Securities downgrading Apple to a sell with a $150 price target, now the street low. All with the expectation of disappointing iPhone sales. We'll speak to an analyst from the firm next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. since Wall Street has been this pessimistic about Apple. Rosenblatt Securities downgraded the stock to a sell. The firm writing, quote, there is less reward for owning Apple after the recent rebound from stock buybacks and stable second quarter guidance. We believe Apple will face fundamental deterioration over the next six to 12 months. 
One of Rosenblatt's managing directors, Jun Zhang, spoke earlier to Bloomberg Television. So the reason we downgrade Apple is that uh, with the stock price rebounding since early this All right, having a little trouble getting that audio there, but you get the gist. That was Jin Zhang of Rosenblatt Securities. Uh, that call brings the total number of bearish analysts on Apple up to five among the 57 ratings tracked by Bloomberg. It is the highest number of sell ratings the iPhone maker has had since at least 1997. I want to stick uh, with the recent downgrade and bring in Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman and Laura Martin, senior analyst at Needham, who currently has a buy rating on Apple and joins us over the firm phone. Uh, so, Laura, what's your take given you've got the opposite rating here? Right, and we added it to the conviction list today. Um, so on the same day they downgraded it sell, we sort of upgraded it, like theoretically. We have a strong buy on the name already. And I think what he's missing per, uh, is that this is really pivoted to a subscription company and a services company, which implies margin expansion. They're now, they just hit 60 million Apple Music subscribers, and they're adding um, about uh, 600 uh, subs a month. And all of that allows us to revalue Apple based on subscription revenue, which is far more visible and less hit driven than device revenue. That's what he's missing, I think. Hmm. Mark, walk us through Rosenblatt's argument here. I mean, obviously it's in part due to you know, potentially disappointing iPhone sales and the fact that 20% of iPhone sales come from China. Yeah, I think that's the big part of it. This is taking us back to the trade war situation where there's a fear that iPhone sales, where they sell a lot of them, or they typically sell a lot of them, are going to go down. But I, I tend to agree with a mix of both perspectives, right? I think Apple is trying to position itself as a subscription company, as a services company. And I also think iPhone sales are in danger of not doing so well this year. But one, quite frankly, I don't think a lot of people are going to really, you know, flock to Apple's new services coming out later this year, other than continued growth for Apple Music and the Apple Card. I'm not terribly bullish on the gaming service, at least initially. I think it's going to get some, need some time to ramp up. Um, the Apple News Plus is not doing as well as I think Apple thought it would do, at least initially. But remember, this thing is only a few months old. On the other hand, the iPhone upgrade cycle this year, I think, is going to be slow like it was last year, because we're not going to see major changes to the iPhone. I think this is going to be a short-term thing, though, because in 2020, I am expecting one of the you know, biggest iPhone overhauls in company history uh, with them integrating 5G, which is going to require a new design, as well as beefed up augmented reality capabilities uh, with a rear-facing 3D sensor. So I think 2019 is going to be a stopgap year. But 2020 is when you're going to see some of these new services begin to really pick up. You're going to see stronger growth in some of these new launches, plus that big iPhone upgrade, as well as a bigger upgrade to the Apple Watch and the iPad as well. So I think 2020 is the year investors should be excited about. Laura, what's your perspective on some of these newer services businesses that may not grow as quickly as Apple would certainly like them to grow, but certainly could grow over time? Yeah, and I'm happy to push back on Mark here because I think everything he's talking about, which is a, a device-centric view, is what this stock was valued on two years ago. And he's late. Sorry, Mark. But this is a company that has 900 million unique users and essentially a monopoly on the 15% richest people in the world, 100% on mobile devices, which we saw this year is just crossed time spent on mobile devices is now just crossed TV. It's 10 minutes longer per day. So the notion that we're talking about devices is somehow being important, I think is antiquated, my view. That what we need to be talking about and thinking about is what Apple is, is 900 million unique users, how much money can we get for, to, from those people and how sticky is that ecosystem? So we need to be thinking about these, not only subscriptions as a way to get more money, but how do we elongate? And as you've noticed, a lot of their subscriptions are family plans now. So that creates more stickiness for that family. So we need to be talking about lifetime value per user and the number of unique users. And really not, a, and, and not matter whether it happens to be a watch or it happens to be a Mac or it happens to be an iPhone. We don't care about the devices. We care about the number of unique users, times value per user, which is in part on revenue, revenue and time spent in the ecosystem. So that's what I think. And I think All that's right, how Mark. the market's valuing this stock today. <laughs>
Mark, your Sorry. turn. Should we should we care less about the devices? No, Laura makes a, a bunch of fair points, but I, I, I disagree that the argument is antiquated because these services need to run on something, right? They don't necessarily run on thin air. The services are not good enough to really compete with those coming from Google, Amazon, and others. People are not going to buy a Google device or an Amazon device and then run Apple services on top of that. So consumers are still going to need to buy Apple devices to use these services or they become pointless. Sure, Apple has these big numbers. They have the 1.4, 1.5 billion unique users. Users. The problem is, is that they're not really taking advantage of them. They're positioning these services as the selling point to that, you know, over 1 billion users, but what they still don't have is some sort of subscription-based service for purchasing an iPhone. They have the iPhone upgrade program, but they really have not rolled it out. So I think until the services are up to snuff where you're going to want to really use these things, they're still, it, this device-centric approach to thinking about the stock is definitely not antiquated. They are a device-centric company. And one more point on this, Apple gets 90% of its revenues almost from hardware devices. So I think going all in on services at this point I think is quite a bit too early and I don't necessarily think that full transition is ever going to happen. And all of that said, Johnny Ive, Apple's chief designer who's been there for, th for 30 years is about to leave Laura and Marks made the argument that even though Johnny Ive wasn't as involved as he had been in earlier years, he was incredibly involved in the Apple Watch, in the AirPods, in some of the biggest hardware hits that Apple has had since the iPhone. Laura, does that concern you? Again, device-centric question. Right, you framed it as a device question. So no, doesn't concern me at all. What I care about is revenue per unique user and lifetime in the ecosystem. So really care a lot more about how many services, are they adding news? Are they adding movies? Are they adding TV? Those are all services that increase stickiness and they increase lifetime value and they may bring in incremental subs. Are they adding watches, which create stickiness? Anything that adds stickiness to the 900 million unique users, all of which are rich and all of which are global, increases the valuation here. Don't care who's designing the products. Not important to me because I'm not a device-centric analysis. So, Mark, I mean, obviously, we're still going to get some device-centric questions given that, as you mentioned, the majority, the vast majority of Apple's revenue still comes from devices. When can that change? It's not going to change. The services need to run on something, right? Services revenue is going to augment the uh, existing devices revenue, right? These services don't run in your head. They don't run on thin air. They run on devices, whether that's from Apple or com competitors. I don't think people running competing devices are going to use Apple services because they are not as good as the services from Amazon that are integrated with their devices and from Google that's integrated into their products. So I think that services is not a replacement for Apple's devices, it augments it. And that's a good thing too. I mean, if you, for some reason, uh, believe that people will subscribe to all of the major Apple services, that over two years is equivalent to one year of annual iPhone upgrade revenue per user. So, you know, $40 a month over two years, that's about $1,000. So that's like, if, if the iPhone sales slow down, that will pick up some of the slack. But is it ever gonna replace it? No, you need devices to run the services. And again, that's just my argument, uh, but I, I truly believe that. Well, it's always good having a healthy debate here on the show. Uh, and Laura Martin of Needham, you are certainly in the majority when it comes to the ratings. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman as well. Thank you both. This will continue, I'm sure, over the next few years. Coming up. Broadcom is said to progress its pursuit for Symantec. We're going to have all the details on the possible all-cash deal next. And Bloomberg Tech live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Now to a story we continue to watch. Bloomberg has learned that Broadcom has secured financing for its acquisition of Symantec. The all-cash deal could value the cybersecurity firm at more than $22 billion. Broadcom estimates that synergy would allow the combined company to save about $1.5 billion. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg's Leanna Baker on the Bloomberg Deals team. So, Leanna, what's the latest? The latest is that the two companies are making a lot of progress. There's financing committed 
on the Broadcom side to buy Symantec. Broadcom has identified these synergy numbers, as you mentioned, 1.5 billion, and the companies are aiming for a mid-July announcement. So things are really moving along. Now, Broadcom's, all of Broadcom's attempts, not all of them, have panned out to buy other companies, notably Qualcomm. Symantec has had a bit of uh, unrest. Uh, the former CEO, Greg Clark, is trying to drum up a rival bid, as I understand it. Is there a chance for, for a legitimate rival bid here? This is a fascinating dynamic because Starboard, the activist investor that essentially ousted Clark, uh, they're you know involved at Symantec. So the question is, would they want to sell to the CEO they just ousted? But two private equity firms, Premier and Advent, which are respectable names, have partnered with Clark. But my sources say that it's sort of a long shot bid. They can't compete with Broadcom on price. This deal involves a lot of financing. Symantec's a big company. So uh, Clark's bid really is not the main attraction here. So what are the chances this happens as is or that talks fall apart? So as you know in deal making, you never know for sure until a deal is announced. Talks can always fall apart last minute. But based on my conversations with sources, it seems like the deal is on track to be announced in mid-July, the week of July 15th. And this is something both companies are working very hard at right now. There are still a few things we don't know. The final premium, what the final stock compo uh, you know, the final stock price will be, but we do know it is an all-cash bid and there is financing committed. So it's really down to the final legs of negotiations. Uh, Broadcom CEO Hawk Tan is known for his great ambition. What is his long-term plan for Broadcom here? That's a great question, Emily. So one of my sources told me that Hawk Tan's vision, he may, he may have even have said this before, he wants to see Broadcom have 50% software revenue and 50% hardware revenue. That's a pretty tall order for a semiconductor company. It's hardware, their sweet spot is chips. So this transition to the software revenue model is gonna take a while, but he's doing big, ambitious, bold plays to get there. This will be the largest deal since CA Technologies last year. All right, Bloomberg's Liana Baker from our deals team. Thank you so much for that update. Coming up, who watches The Watchmen? We'll look at how Facebook fights fake news about Facebook on Facebook. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Facebook's history when it comes to fake news is infamous. From the disinformation campaigns waged on the social network during the 2016 elections, to debunking conspiracy theories, to doctored videos of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. But what about when those lies are about Facebook? On Facebook. According to documents seen by Bloomberg, the social media giant uses tools with names like Storm Chaser and The Night's Watch. Yes, as in The Night's Watch from Game of Thrones. Only this time, the enemy isn't White Walkers and The Night King, but how news coverage of Facebook spread on the social network and apps like WhatsApp. To tell us all about it, Bloomberg Tech's Kurt Wagner, who of course covers Facebook, and our editor, Alistair Barr. So, what exactly is Facebook doing here? Yeah, well, there's a couple different software programs. You mentioned them, Storm Chaser and Nice Watch, which allow Facebook to basically scrape the service and find out, hey, is, is a meme that might be untrue going viral? Who's seen it and how can we kind of get ahead of it? And so what we saw they used it for was to find when, you know, there was misinformation about Facebook. So, for example, you might have seen those kind of copy and paste memes where, hey, send this to 10 friends, otherwise we're going to delete your account, that type of thing. And what Facebook would track that when it'd get to a certain level of popularity, they might jump in and actually tell people this isn't true you know don't worry about it so the question here is was Facebook giving the same attention to you know stories about the Pope endorsing President Trump or killings in Myanmar right I mean do we know it certainly looks bad but there's a there's a there's a difference between Facebook obviously knows more about what, what's going on with its own company than, than, than things in Myanmar so it so it hires outside fact-checking 
companies um, to, 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 to basically go and spend actually a, a very long time tr trying to confirm some of these other stories about what's happening in other countries and politics and that type of thing. Um, but it certainly does show, show where its priorities lie. It, 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 it obviously wants to quash um, rumors about itself a, a lot more than rumors about other things on the network. Right, and Facebook routinely does, you know, surveys. You know, you talk about yep. this a little bit in the article. We've talked about it before. Of how do people feel about Sheryl Sandberg and right. Mark Zuckerberg and the like? Yeah, that's uh, a, it's a kind of a second part of this story is that they were out actually doing kind of market research, the same type of stuff that you might see a, a political campaign do with its politician is figure out where does this candidate, or in this case Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg, where, what are their strengths? What words do people associate with them? And the idea being that if you understand where you know Mark can go out and actually land a message home, and where he might go out and people might say, well, we don't actually you know trust Mark, so we're not going to listen. That can be very helpful as you're trying to navigate you know this regulation that they're going through or, or other big problems. And so uh, we saw a slide deck that kind of outlined some of the research that they'd done, and it was just fascinating to see uh, that they view those two on you know they were comparing them to celebrities popular celebrities uh, the Pope was was on this grid where they were mapped and so you just get a sense for how big Facebook is but also how big the personalities of, of their leaders are is it fair isn't it fair should I say Alistair for companies to be able to do, to do market research on themselves and to manage their own reputations well we asked we asked quite a few people about that and, and it is very common to do that and it's also common for companies to go on social media and see what people are saying about them too um, but but Facebook is different both, both from the social network part of, part of the point, which is that they own it, um, but also from the surveying point because Facebook is, is, is super powerful now and Mark Zuckerberg owns so much of it. Um, and, and the most interesting comparison in this survey we, we, that, that I saw at least was the comparison with Bill Gates. Um, super interesting. Yes, fascinating anecdote there. Tell us about it. Um, well, the, the, generally it was basically that, that Bill Gates had gone through three stages of his career. So one was an innovator, one was kind of a monopolist, and then one was a philanthropist. And, and if you compare where Mark Zuckerberg is now, I, I like to think, well, he's gone through the innovation stage, he's kind of at, at a regulatory crossroads right now and he, he's a budding philanthropist could he become a philanthropist in, in the view of, a, of, of the world and the question's still out. Kurt the comparison basically pegged Zuckerberg as uninnovative yeah right and then had him next to Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk right who were examples of still innovating. <laughs> yeah, so we heard through the, the reporting of the story that, you know, when the slide deck was presented to Mark Zuckerberg, there was this slide that kind of showed him and Bill Gates together as, as former innovators, uh, whereas Bezos and Musk were current innovators, and that you could hear a pin drop in the room. It was it was a bit of an awkward thing to you present. You used the word incredulous. Yeah, he I was. I, I was told that he was. You know, he couldn't quite believe that he would be viewed in that way. And and to some extent, I think you know it's fair. He's still in his early 30s, really, right? So the fact that he's a past innovator and he can no longer innovate, I, it matters a lot to him. Not only from a recruiting standpoint, but just as a you know reputation and, and building Facebook into what he wants to build it into. So that was a uh, an interesting anecdote that we heard and wanted to highlight because we thought. It just kind of conveyed a little bit about how he thinks about himself, but also how the company thinks about itself. Meantime, there's this social media summit that's been called in Washington that the White House has called, but hasn't invited Facebook or reportedly Twitter. What's actually going to happen at this summit? We don't know. And it's really hard to have a social media summit when you don't invite the social media platforms that everyone uh, is complaining about. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of uh, uh, conservative, um, either politicians or thought leaders, if you want to call them that, who actually have problems with these platforms like Facebook. They think that it stifles free speech or it might uh, over-censor. And so uh, because the companies themselves don't sound like they're going to be there, I know Facebook was not invited, it does make you question, well, what exactly will be accomplished at, at a hearing like this? It could end up being a Facebook bash session, mm -hmm. um, but we don't really know exactly. They haven't, as far as I know, uh, issued a, a guest list. Right. And of course, the president has certainly bashed Facebook and other social media companies for anti-conservative bias. As I understand it, you've got not Facebook and Twitter invited, but there are some bloggers <laughs> invited, some allies of the president, some conservative groups. I mean, what are we expecting? Maybe you could have MySpace or Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> some defunct social networks. 
Uh, I, I think I think probably it will be a, another attack on on social networks, and 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 it, I, I imagine it will be quite quite political. So I think that there's two main ways to criticize social networks in my view which is you know you're not you're not paying attention to all the content on there you should be paying more attention to it be more responsible for it and then the other side is oh well you're 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 um, cracking down on conservative voices and your bias which which is kind of two separate things and I think it'll be more the, the latter. Kurt what's Facebook's response to the storm chaser and night watch? Yeah revelations well their their biggest concern was mostly that they actually go in full circle to where we started this conversation they didn't really want to be viewed as having a a tool to fix fake news and having only been using it on themselves you know when we reached out to them and, and kind of outlined here's what we've learned uh, the on the record statement they gave back to us was was pretty much hey you can't really compare this storm chaser tool to what we do with fake news now and I think the reality is less that it could have been used I, I mean in as far as I can tell, if they had wanted to track a certain meme or a certain uh, you know, fake news story, they certainly could have. I think the difference is they weren't looking for it and neither was anybody else. And so they had this thing and they were using it for a very narrow purpose, which was just to you know, deal with Facebook specifically. Uh, the reality is they just weren't you know, prepared to use it for anything other could than that. Could it now be applied to other issues? Yeah, I think it could. I mean, the technology still exists. Um, so it, we're told it's no longer used in the way that it was uh, to kind of fight fake uh, Facebook memes as it, as it maybe was at the beginning. But it's still there. Uh, I think the reality, though, is that they're looking for it so much more closely now. And there's uh, other systems in place that they didn't have in 2016. For example, the fact checkers that Ali mentioned, you know, they're working with a bunch of outside organizations to actually not just uh, track this stuff, but, but debunk it a little bit with someone who's not a Facebook employee. All right, uh, Bloomberg's Alistair Barr and Kurt Wagner, thank you. Fascinating story. Okay, coming up, Pi Metrics is bringing AI to recruiting. How the startup is using tech to combat discriminatory bias in the hiring process. Next, this is Bloomberg. The average job posting receives over 250 applications, but recruiting candidates based solely on resume review can often lead to gender and racial bias. AI startups Pymetrics wants to level the playing field by using neuroscience-based games to help companies like LinkedIn and Unilever compare applicants to top performing employees. Pymetrics builds a unique trait profile based on the game performance of current employees and matches it to the best talent. The startup has already raised $57 million in funding from Coastal Ventures and Salesforce Ventures and has over 80 clients. Joining us from New York for our Work Shifted series is Pymetrics CEO and co-founder Frida Poli. Frida, how exactly does this work? Sure, happy to tell you that. So we take people's cognitive and emotional traits and use that to match them to their ideal role rather than looking at their resume, which can often lead to a biased and oftentimes not predictive outcome for the candidate. So how do you determine their cognitive and emotional traits? Yeah, sure. So I spent 10 years at Harvard and MIT as a cognitive neuroscientist. Cognitive neuroscientists around the globe have developed a series of computer activities that can tell you things about your memory, your attention, your sequencing, your risk profile, your reward sensitivity, all sorts of cognitive and emotional facets of people. And instead of using somebody's resume to predict their success in a role, we look at sort of more fundamental traits. So instead of judging a book by its color, Cover, which would be the resume, we look more deeply inside of them. So would this be good enough in your view to replace an in-person interview? So we don't replace any human-to-human -human, uh, contact. What we do is replace that process of a person scanning a resume, which we know from all the countless studies that have been done on it to be highly biased. So I always say if you want to make a racist, sexist, elitist, or ageist decision, use a resume because unfortunately that's what all the studies show. So we don't replace any humans or human to human interaction. We are just shortlisting candidates for um, recruiters to look more closely at rather than having them go through the sort of manual repetitive review of a resume, which, you know, quite frankly is, you know, not the most exciting part of their job and really not where they outperform. So now I understand the goal is to take the bias out of the process, yep. but algorithms are always biased based on the biases of their creators, mm -hmm. right? And so how can you be sure you're not inter 
introducing new kinds of bias. So let's say, for example, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when they were looking for, for tech talent to join the exploding technology industry, they did a lot of aptitude tests and personality mm -hmm. tests, yeah. which, to be fair, eliminated a lot of people who didn't fit into the sort of white male sure. nerd engineer stereotype? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the way that we do it, so I would I would say that it's not always the case that AI has to be biased. Um, AI can be biased. It can also be unbiased. It really depends on the creator of the technology and what they do to prevent those biases. So what we propose and what we've open sourced on GitHub is a way to audit any algorithm to see if it is biased for Caucasians or biased for males. And if we see that, we will actually tweak the algorithms so that they no longer show that and that they are producing a fair outcome for men and women and people of different ethnic backgrounds, not to mention people of different socioeconomic backgrounds and others. So it's really all in the design. Technology is neutral. It's how you design it. And you can actually remove bias from an algorithm. It's impossible to remove bias from a human. So I actually think we have more hope in removing bias from technology if we use open source audited methods, which we do. Interesting, yeah. fascinating stuff. Yeah. Uh, Pymetric CEO and co-founder Frida Poli uh, will be tracking your progress. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Still ahead, Amazon's Prime Shopping Day is primed for a worker strike. Why some employees in Minnesota are saying enough is enough. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Microsoft is looking to highlight the power of its cloud computing when it comes to healthcare. The software giant has announced it signed a five-year deal with a nonprofit multi-state hospital chain, Providence St. Joseph Health, to be a customer for its Azure Cloud and AI tools. Providence St. Joseph Health will use those tools to track electronic health data like surgery outcomes and cancer therapies. They now join Kroger and Walgreens Boots Alliance as Microsoft Cloud customers. To discuss, I want to bring in Microsoft Healthcare Vice President Peter Lee, who joins us live from Microsoft headquarters in Redmond, Washington. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. So what kinds of things is Providence going to do here and how will it impact patients? Well, Emily, it's great to talk to you again. Well, we'll be bringing Microsoft's cloud and AI tools uh, to Providence St. Joseph Health across all 191,000 of their employees and all 51 of their hospitals to improve clinical outcomes and improve the day-to-day -day working experience of the caregivers. Uh, it's really intended to bring much more data and data intelligence uh, to the people that, that matter. So let's talk about some specific examples. There is an example in our uh, Bloomberg News story about this partnership, about a knee surgery in particular, and how you and they can use data to get a better handle on what works and doesn't work. Explain that. Oh, that, it, that's really a great example to bring up because it was one of the examples that really impressed me the first time that we really went deep with Providence. If you look across all of the, say, arthroscopic knee surgeries that Providence has done over the years, you find tremendous variations, sometimes as much as a 10x variation in the satisfaction that patients have for the outcomes and a 200x variation in costs. And if you plot out all of the data that went into each one of those surgeries and start to go deep using machine learning and AI, you start to do, discover clinical pathways that allow you to optimize and give clinicians decision support to produce the best possible patient satisfaction uh, at the most reasonable cost. Now, the healthcare industry has been notoriously slow to adopt new technology. I mean, it can be impossible to even send your doctor an email, for example. What has been holding the healthcare industry back from embracing technology like, say, Microsoft's technology, and how long is that going to take to fundamentally well, change? Yeah, it, I know it seems slow and it is frustrating, but in fact, it, it's hard to uh, remember that actually just 15 years ago, less than 15% of our health records were in digital form, whereas today, almost 100% of digital health records in the United States are now in digital form. And that gives us a foundation for just lot of possibilities in extracting insights from that data. And so it seems like it's slow, but we're now at a place where we have this wonderful digital foundation. And this is exactly the foundation that Providence and Microsoft want to, to build on today. So let's talk about the possibilities. How will the cloud in the future make my experience as a patient, for example, vastly different? 
Well, one of the projects that we're doing with Providence in this uh, partnership agreement is we're going to look across all of the electronic health records for all of Providence's patients that are undergoing uh, treatment for cancer. And hidden in all of that kind of text and unstructured data are patterns that might lead to insights, earlier diagnosis, uh, and better treatment possibilities for those cancer patients by integrating across all of that data. Right now, that data is siloed across dozens of different data systems that have been collected over the years. By bringing it all to the cloud and then using not only Microsoft's Azure Cloud, but also Microsoft 365 so that caregivers can collaborate with each other on those discoveries and on Dynamics so that the operations of Providence then can be managed uh, all in the cloud gives the possibility to go really at scale across the entirety of Providence's health system. All right, interesting stuff. Microsoft's Peter Lee, thank you so much for sharing this news with us. Well, Amazon's annual Prime Day starts July 15th, this July 15th, and workers at one of the e-commerce giant's warehouses in Minnesota are going to use that day to highlight what they view as unfair working conditions. They are planning a six-hour strike on Prime Day and some engineers are planning to join on the strike as well to show solidarity. This isn't expected to disrupt Amazon logistically, but will it be enough to get Amazon to meet their demands? To discuss, Bloomberg Spencer Soper, who's been covering the story for us in Seattle. So Spencer, what are the demands here? Um, they're, they're, they're fairly general. They, they're uh, uh, wanting Amazon to convert more uh, temporary employees to permanent status. That's uh, always a source of tension with Amazon because of the cyclical nature of its business. It needs to really ramp up in the fourth quarter around the holidays and then let a lot of people go. So they want to see more people kept on as uh, permanent employees. And they also want some rates uh, relaxed, production rates uh, relaxed. Amazon is always uh, turning the knobs and, you know, trying to get, make these places run as efficiently as possible. And so the employees are looking for that to be re relaxed a little bit. Now, this is the first time, as I understand it, that Amazon workers are striking in the middle of a huge event, let's say, you know, a Prime Day or over Christmas or, or, or Black Friday. Is this really not going to have any impact on the logistics? Yeah, well, so Amazon has faced this in Europe in the past. So they faced strikes on big shopping days like Black Friday, like Prime Day in Europe, and they've been able to weather them just fine. This one, we're probably looking at about 100 workers, and Amazon's got more than 100 warehouses around the country and hundreds of thousands of people working in them. So the participation will be uh, quite small, a small fraction of their overall workforce, so not likely to be much of a dent. Uh, it, it's a bigger threat, uh, you know, optically, because Amazon's very very uh, sensitive about its public image and how it treats workers. It Last year, it raised uh, wages for all warehouse workers to a minimum of $15 an hour after getting criticism for, you know, getting tax breaks and then having some of its employees on food stamps and that sort of thing. So they're very sensitive to this image. And so this is going to, you know, just broadcast that the labor unrest remains during one of Amazon's big uh, shopping days. Right. You had Senator Bernie Sanders also trying to pass the Stop Bezos Act to put a extra tax on, on, on companies like Amazon. Um, Amazon, in a statement, said to us, the fact is Amazon offers already what this outside organization is asking for. We provide great employment opportunities with excellent pay. We encourage anyone to compare our pay, benefits, and workplace to other retailers and major employers in the Shakopee community and across the country, and we invite anyone to see for themselves by taking a tour of the facility. Now, an employee who's one of those Shakopee uh, folks who's organizing this strike, William Stoles, also told us Amazon is going to be telling the story about itself, which is they can ship a Kindle to your house in one day. Isn't that wonderful? We want to take the opportunity to talk about what it takes to make that work happen and put pressure on Amazon to protect us and provide safe and reliable jobs. So the question, Spencer, is will they inflict that pressure and will that pressure be enough to make a change? That's a that's a great question, and uh, there there's two things on the in working in the workers' favor. Uh, one is this is a tight labor market, so workers can feel emboldened about making demands, and and companies, you know, just out of necessity, you know, have to be more receptive to them because it's so difficult to replace workers that leave. The other interesting thing is how 
Uh, you mentioned earlier in the segment how some of Amazon's corporate employees in Seattle will actually be traveling to Minnesota to, to help. And these are employees who have been active on the climate front. They want Amazon to do more to reduce fossil fuel consumption and address climate change. And so we're seeing this, uh, these coalitions building between Amazon employees. So some of the climate change workers are saying, hey, you know what? We hear what you workers in the warehouse are, are asking about. We support you. We're going to fly out and support you. So they, you see the employees kind of uh, banding together to make their voices a little louder. All right. We'll be following it as I know you will be. Spencer Soper for Bloomberg in Seattle. Thank you so much for your reporting on this. Meantime, the U.S. women's team wasn't the only winner at Soccer's World Cup. According to Fox Sports, the American audience for the game was 20% higher than last year's men's final. And in the Netherlands, which lost to the U.S. 2-0, nearly 90% of those watching TV tuned in. Go team. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter, of course. You can check us out there at Technology. You can follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter as well. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.